Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is John Cochran. John is a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a former professor of finance at the University of Chicago. He is also a distinguished senior fellow at the Becker Friedman Institute, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, and an adjunct scholar of the Cato Institute. He has published widely in finance and economics in top journals. He writes occasional op-eds for the Wall Street Journal, and he blogs at the Grumpy Economist. John, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. I want to begin by asking you how you got into finance and economics. I was looking at your bio, and it said as an undergrad you were a physics major. So how does a physics major find his way into the world of finance and economics? Uh, Yeah, well, I wandered around a long time (laughs) in figuring out what I was going to do, as I think we all do. Um, So I I, I loved physics as an undergrad. and Towards the end of my undergraduate career, I realized I wasn't a good enough mathematician to be a theorist. And I wasn't I'm a terrible manager, so I was not set out to be an experimentalist. And I loved economics. I had, had uh, taken some economics classes and um, it just had sort of a conversion moment in my micro class when I huh. first saw the budget constraint facing people with welfare and realized uh, I would have done the same thing they did. And, and that was just so beautiful. And here's a, a, a social scientific question that's wrapped up with all this moral and, and, and uh, culture and so forth. And you look at the budget constraint, you know, boy, I would do the same thing they would. So I, I, I kind of went off to a grad school in economics, the sort of thing that's very hard to do these days. I called up in August the places that let me in in physics and said, hey, how about I do economics instead? Really? And, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Berkeley and Chicago, believe it or not, let me in. I went to Berkeley because I knew it didn't snow. I, I started doing micro because I loved it. It was so beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I didn't think I could do any research in micro. It all seemed like it had been solved. Okay. So I, I got interested in time series uh, and macro, mostly time series. which is uh, So I did time series, and I, I came to Chicago and got to know uh, – uh, Lars Hansen and Bob Lucas and Gene Fama, and, and they got me uh, sort of more interested in the macro end of things, and then I kind of wandered over to finance. And What's great about economics is, is that the same kind of tool. You can jump around and do a lot of things these days. Right. Now, is it true that you're related to Eugene Fama? Yeah, that's right. I, uh, I sort of moved to Chicago and married the boss's daughter. <laughs> I'm just curious, what is it like at Thanksgiving dinners? Do you guys debate, you know, the intricacies of finance and economics? Uh, not really. Uh, um, we, uh, Gene likes to talk about business in the office and, and other things at home. Okay. Uh, so we, do, we do sometimes talk about economics at home. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but mostly we, uh, we keep to that, that uh, schedule. Well, I'm impressed. You're able to compartmentalize your life like that. Okay. Well, let me ask about something you've gone into more recently, and that's blogging. And you've been a very effective blogger. I mean, I, I you know, everyone seems to when you when you post something, it seems to be widely circulated. It's it's, it's it goes through Twitter. Have have you found blogging to be useful uh, for your work and for just your overall enjoyment as as an economist? Yeah, very much so. Uh, I'm very glad I did it. I think it's a useful thing. I, I think we're in a uh, in a moment of evolution for how economic ideas. Uh, go around and and, um, and and get debated. Uh, the journals, believe it or not, journals used to be how people communicated ideas. Mm-hmm. People would actually read journals to find out what's new and what's going on. Whereas, of course, now they're, they're five-year-old stuff. It's, it's, now it is important. It's where things are carved in stone and fully refined and so forth. Yep. And the blogs have been, I think, quite use, useful in both applying economic ideas to public policy in a way you just can't do in an op-ed, um, and it's a way to have debate about how does economics fit public policy and, and debates about economics. I think one of the high points is I, I wrote kind of a, a uh, one-week essay thinking some things through out loud, and then Mike Woodford picked it up and wrote a paper about it. And so wow. we kind of had an interchange at the level that you, you – a written interchange at the level, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that you couldn't – normally would have – I don't know how you'd have that. Uh, it all happened much, the, the back and forth happened. Um, and so I think blogs are emerging. Now, blogs are, are they're a combination of, of commentary and a little bit political stuff. And there's people who like to fight with each other on blogs and, <laughs> and ideas. I think that's, 
right. it's got to right. sort itself out, and and I think we'll find a uh, a, a better way of, of disseminating and and uh, talking to each other uh, in a in a structured way, but with the immediacy of the blog uh, right. format. Well, it's been fun for me to watch policy be at least influenced or informed in real time by blogging. I remember um, TARP, when TARP was first announced, the blogosphere went postal against that, the initial two-page, one-page document. And um, I remember this, the feedback occurring, and and the Treasury actually invited some bloggers up to the Treasury building and talked to them about it. Um, And then some of the QE debates, what the Fed's doing— um, it's always interesting to see Janet Yellen get asked questions that we were just discussing the day before in the blogosphere at her press conferences. And then what you're suggesting, more you know, formal thinking, you know, develop an idea out loud, you get feedback, and then you can turn it into some serious research. So it's it's for my end, it's been great watching this. I feel more informed. I feel more engaged. Maybe I, I can say I found my people through, you know, through blogging and, and Twitter um, that in another world, another time, I wouldn't have been able to do so. But let's move on to your research, and in particular, one area where you've made a big contribution, and that is the fiscal theory of the price level. And as a way to kind of motivate our discussion to get us going, I want to just mention some articles that came out late last year, some in August, but a couple a Wall Street Journal story and an Economist story, and they were just beside themselves trying to make sense of the low inflation that's going on around the world, ever from the U.S. to Europe to Japan. And, you know, it seems like central banks are trying really hard. You've got, uh, at least in Europe, you've got massive QE. Japan's still doing Albanomics. Um, the Fed's had rates really low. They, they've, they you know, stopped their QE. They still have a large balance sheet. And they were perplexed. They couldn't make sense of why do we have, you know, low inflation. Um, even some Fed officials who were going to the uh, Jackson Hole meeting in one of these articles mentioned they weren't sure it themselves. Um, they were losing faith. So my question to you is, you know, what is this fiscal theory of the price level, and can it be used to help us make sense of what's going on with inflation in the world today? Okay, well, yeah, those are two big questions. <laughs> well, let's do one at a time. Um, Start with the fiscal theory, then yeah. we can apply it. Well, let me, so the, the fiscal theory is not a let's explain the latest data point uh, theory. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I think it's a framework that, that I think I think it's the framework that helps us understand these things uh, very much. So, uh, so let me back up. Let, let's talk about the fiscal theory and, and, and what it is. So this, and, and let's talk in general terms, not not about the latest. Why is inflation so puzzlingly low? Okay. Because um, you know I'm not going to give you a magic bullet on that one. Although I will give you an interpretation. Yep. Um, but um, let's go back to the puzzling question of all, which is, is where does inflation come from? Why does money have value? When you think about it, um, you know, we, you work really hard for pieces of paper, and those pieces of paper didn't cost a lot to make. So why in the world uh, are those pieces of paper so valuable? That, that's a deep puzzle in economics. Uh, the fiscal theory of the price level answers that with a very simple answer. The reason people are willing to work so hard for those pieces of paper is because the government accepts those pieces of paper for tax payments at the end of the day. So you, you need to get some U.S. dollars on April 15th, and you need to get them to pay your taxes with. And um, uh, you're willing to take those dollars from somebody else in return for, say, your work, mm-hmm. because you'll, you know, and you know you can give those dollars to another person in return for something because he needs them in order to pay his taxes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, why does money have value? Because uh, the government accepts it for taxes. And that's, not, that's an old insight. It's in Adam Smith, actually. But it's kind of revolutionary in that um, it, it is, I think it is the only theory that is coherent at the moment, that, that, make, that makes any sense as a matter of economic logic in, in current institutions. So, um, you know, the alternatives are our are, are money is just, it's kind of like clamshells. We only use one thing, mm-hmm. but that doesn't really describe our money anymore. So the, the Milton Friedman monetarism uh, view that it's just something, an arbitrary social convention in, in restricted supply. Well, it's not in restricted supply. Our government's target interest rates, classic theory says if you target interest rates, inflation is undetermined. Well, uh, without the fiscal theory. So that just doesn't work. And the other view is that kind of the Fed, by manipulating interest rates and Phillips curve and so forth, that, that's what determines inflation. Well, that's, that's not really an economic theory. So I, I, the fiscal theory of the price level is, as far as I can tell, 
the only coherent theory we have, and then the job is to make it work. Okay. Well, let me ask so, this. Oh, go ahead. I'm have, sorry. Have I, have I explained the basic idea and, mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, ask me some questions? About yeah, that? I, I will. Um, and I want to actually get into the weeds a little bit before I do that. I, I just stepping back, in the fiscal theory of the price level, is it accurate to say it, it explains the explains the velocity of money? If I take the equation of exchange, um, what it really does is it explains to a large extent what drives velocity, whereas a standard monetary theory focuses more on the on the supply of money. No, no. So the, okay. the fiscal theory says velocity is pretty much irrelevant. So All right. um, the standard monetary theory, there's two kinds of government debt. Money is just government debt. Money is zero maturity, non-interest paying government debt. The only difference between money and a treasury bill is that a treasury bill pays a little bit of interest. And, and, um, so the standard monetary theory says it's incredibly important how the government divides up its debt between money and interest paying debt. Okay. Uh, and the fiscal theory says, no, that doesn't really matter that much at all. What matters is the total amount of government debt relative to the government's uh, willing to soak up that debt with tax payments. Uh, now, velocity is about the split of government debt between money or short-term, short maturity and, and longer-term debt. And so that split is really important. It's, it's like it's really important whether, whether the government prints up dollar bills or quarters. Or, or do, well, dollar bills are five dollar bills. So standard monetary theory says if you print up too many one dollar bills and not enough five dollar bills, you're in trouble. Whereas the fiscal theory says no, 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 just that you know one dollar bills, five dollar bills. It, it, what matters is the government's ability to pay back all its debt. And so where inflation comes from is when people don't want to hold government debt of all maturities, money, short term debt, long term debt. Uh, and when they have faith in the government's ability to repay its debt at all maturities, then then inflation goes down. But doesn't that work through velocity in this story that people want to get rid of government bonds and then they they you know they they sell them and the transactions causes velocity to go up and that causes the inflation to go up? Well, I think you're still thinking about the split, the portfolio split, okay, between holding money and government bonds as opposed to. How much of your overall portfolio do you want to uh, have with the government versus with uh, private debt? Okay. And the, now there is, you know, when there are – so what's beautiful about the first fiscal theory is it allows you to, to start with something frictionless. Um, as we do in all economics, you want to start with supply and demand and market clearing and then add the bells and whistles. So the fiscal theory, you start with, look, all government debt is government debt, and it doesn't really make any difference if it's money or bonds. Then if you want, we can add some bells and whistles. Mm-hmm. The standard monetary economics takes only the bells and whistles and throws out the basic supply and demand. The, the fiscal theory really says what, what matters to inflation in the end is uh, the overall quantity of government debt and can the government pay it back, okay. as opposed to the structure of government debt that they print up, is it too much money versus too few bonds, too much bonds versus too too little money. All right. Well, let me dig into this uh, theory a little bit more. And in the model, in your papers you've presented, there are two key equations to the fiscal theory, as I understand it. One that relates to current government liabilities, both you know the bonds and the money, the monetary base and government bonds, to the present value of expected surpluses over the long run. And that's, that's a mouthful. And on the blog for this uh, – Interview. I'll I'll post the equation so their listeners can see it. But there's that first equation, and then you have the second equation, the equation of exchange: money times velocity equals the price level times real GDP. And this is the very basic model that you're describing. And I, I just wanted to get into it and, and ask a question: in terms of the expected surpluses in the long horizon, what what horizon should we be thinking of? So, if the present value of of these um, expected surpluses determine, you know. The value of government government liabilities. How far out should we be looking? Let me just uh, to, to try to demystify those two equations we yeah. just talked about. There's a lot here that's that's imperialistic from from finance. So when we think about the value of a company, we think about the stock price is determined by the present value of the profits you're going to get primarily, right? Right. And then secondarily, well, there might be some market friction. So it matters if you have common stock or preferred stock. 
Do you have a loss of stock and, and, and less bonds? The value of the company is the present value of all the profits, but maybe there's this Yanni Miller theorem that says it doesn't matter if you issue stock or bonds, but maybe it really does matter that some kinds of stock bonds, you can, you can tweak the value of the company with these changes. So this is the same idea applied to government finances. Uh, how much is all of the government's liabilities worth? Well, that's the present value of the quote profits of how much the government will soak up from taxpayers to give back from bondholders. Now, there might be a secondary friction. Now, you know, in frictionless economics, Modigliani Miller theorem, it doesn't matter if the government issues long term debt or short term debt or money debt or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, stocks and bonds, the total value of the company is the present, the total present value of the profits is the total value of the liabilities. Well, maybe there's some frictions that people really want green colored money, not red colored money, or they want money, not bonds. Mm -hmm. And that's the second equation you mentioned. And in standard economics, uh, standard monetary economics, we focused all on this little friction and kind of forgotten about the underlying value of the company is, is present value of profits equation. So what we're doing with the fiscal theory is just as we did with finance in about 1968, uh, putting value of all government debt is present value of how much the government is going to pay back that debt. In that comes first, and only second comes little frictions between different kinds of debt. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you know, serious inflation. I can't think of a single serious inflation that happened to a government that was running big surpluses and just its central bank did something stupid. All serious inflations come when when governments don't have the capacity to pay back their debts. And then what happens? People say, well, the government can't pay them back, so I guess I better try to get rid of this. Well, let's go out and, and try to give some of this debt to the grocery store and, and get some more food. Well, everyone's doing that, and that ends up driving up the price of food. So, so when people lose faith in the government's ability to pay back its debt, that, that feels like aggregate demand, and it drives mm -hmm. up price. That's the mechanism, R real simple. So that was the first part of the question. Now I forgot the second part of your question. Well, I was just asking, so in that, in that present value equation oh, yeah. for, far, for the government yeah. liabilities, I, I, there's two parts to it. There's first the, the numerator, you, you have the actual expected surpluses, and then the denominator, you got a discount rate. And which one's more important over what horizon? Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, that depends on the maturity structure of the government debt. Uh, but typically, governments are very – so what makes this hard – uh, the fiscal theory is, is hard to apply to the data, much harder than NV equals PY. Mm -hmm. uh, NV equals PY is, is a sim it's simple tool, you know, money times velocity equals uh, price level times nominal income. And, and, you know, Friedman and Schwartz can go write a book on, on interpreting it, you know, every, every month of that. It's much harder with the fiscal theory because the, the equivalent of the PY is not this year's income, it's this present value of future right. surplus. And governments are very, very long-lived. In fact, you know, the, 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 if the United States wants to run surpluses, we're talking 40, 50 years of surplus. Governments pay back their debts over extraordinarily long amounts of time. So when you want to take this empirically, you have to think about these present values taking place of enormous amount. One of the biggest, so the World War II debt in the U.S., very big debt, I think mm -hmm. like 200% debt to GDP, that was paid back over 30 to 40 years. The Napoleonic War debt of, of, of Britain, that's one of the biggest we've ever seen, I think, 250% debt to GDP ratio, they paid that back over a century. So there's a very long horizon there. And then the second difficulty is the one you just mentioned. The sec One thing we've learned crystal clear from asset prices is that stock prices uh, reflect discount rates as much or more than they reflect um, the, the, the actual cash payments of dividends. When, when stock prices are high relative to dividends, that means expected returns and discount rates are low. It doesn't mean dividends are going up in the future. And the same thing is true, and, and, and if you want to try to interpret data, the only hope to interpret data is to think that the same thing is true of, of government debt. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, 2008, we had a big recession, huge deficits, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and yet inflation went down like crazy. So, you know, how could a company be having huge losses and its stock price go up? That's the equivalent of what we just saw. The, the government is hemorrhaging money, and yet everybody wants to hold his debt and is driving up the price of government debt and getting away from other stuff. Well, 
you kind of know what was going on then. Everybody wanted to hold government debt, and they're willing to hold government debt at a low rate of return. The discount rate for government debt went down like crazy, even though the deficits, you know, look terrible. Mm-hmm. And so in accounting for inflation with the fiscal theory, we have to face up, I think, to the fact that the discount rate variation in the short run is going to be really important for understanding short run fluctuations in inflation. So the discount rate is what really drives business cycles. Is that another way of saying that? Yeah. Now that's, uh, that's or is that my too strong? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I think you're exactly, as I integrate sort of what I've learned in the last 30 years about finance and macroeconomics, uh, macro isn't really paying attention to this fact, but, but finance is all about changes in risk premiums, not, not changes in the level of interest rates, which we all spend mm-hmm. a lot of time on. Changes in risk premiums. How much do you expect to earn on stocks over bonds? How much, what's the spread between mortgages and, and, and um, treasuries? So the risk premiums vary tremendously, and they vary with the business cycle. The business cycle is about people's willingness to take risk not really about the level of interest rates. And, and in a recession, people's willingness to take risks plummets. They all try to buy government bonds. That sends the price of government bonds up and inflation down. That's, that's I think, how the fiscal theory okay. uh, will, will, will understand the data. That, that, so that's, that's not just the fiscal theory itself. That, that's also how it's going to be, have to be used to understand the data. Now, going back to my original motivation for the fiscal theory of the price level discussion, we have these low inflation rates throughout most of the uh, least advanced economies of the world, Europe, the U.S., Japan. Is that the explanation you would give now is that the discount rates have changed such that you know, people are clamoring for, well, the rates have changed as a reflection of the clamoring for safe assets across the world, and that's what's causing uh, inflation to fall? Well, there's two possibilities. Um, the, so the present value of the, the government bonds are at all-time highs, right? Right. The prices are high, the interest rates are low. So either people think governments are going to be running really big surpluses in the future, and, and this is a good investment, or they are willing to hold government debt uh, despite very low rates of return, the discount rate effect. As I look out the window, it smells of discount rate effect to me. It smells of, right, demand for safe assets, um, demand for nominally safe assets. I mean, government debt might uh, inflate, but it mm-hmm. won't explicitly default. You'll never go to bankruptcy court uh, in, in a financial crisis. So people, as I look out the window, it, it smells to me like a discount rate rather than our governments are all just, you know, that right. in, in 10 years, the tax revenues are just going to be flowing in more than the spending. <laughs> and, and yeah, right. that, Unlikely. that doesn't Unlikely. look like it. So now, uh, it, it is, there is a danger that, this is, I don't like to use the word bubble, but uh, I will, because there's, government debt is very short term. So people holding government, debt, on average, even, even the U.S. rolls over, we roll over half our debt every two years. Um, now, short term debt is very prone to um, having a high value for a long time, and then everyone tries to get out at once. Um, so um, when you think about things through the fiscal theory, we have low inflation now. But it doesn't give you, if it's a discount rate effect and if it's short-term debt, uh, everyone could head for the hills at the same time at any moment. Uh, so Greece's debt had very low mm-hmm. interest rates and very low inflation in about 2006. Uh, and they discovered that things can change quickly. So I think it does warn us that things can change quickly. Well, uh, a couple questions. Well, first, what would be the alternative? So let's say that moment arrives, that that uh, moment when suddenly discount rates suddenly, you know, they change dramatically. People don't want to hold government debt. I mean, would, would they not move into some other kind of asset? What would they go into? Commodities? I and mean, what would happen in that type of an environment? I mean, Absolutely. So let's, let, let's, let's paint a picture. Suppose, suppose happens we discover that all the books are cooked in China mm-hmm. and uh, – <laughs> Simultaneously, we, we discover that, um, uh, you know, California can't pay its pensions, Illinois can't pay its pensions. Usually things like this start with some sort of scandal mm-hmm. uh, and a bunch of banks go under or whatever. Um, and people decide, you know what, the great sovereign debt bubble is going about to burst. So what do they do? Yeah, they try to get their money out of government debt. What do you do when you want to get your money out of government debt? Well, um, yeah, you buy stocks, bond, stocks and real estate and bonds. You buy assets, real assets that the government uh, can't get at. 
Um, and that drives up the prices of those assets. Um, so you get people call it asset price inflation, the word I hate, but yeah. <laughs> and then, and then the, the price of those assets goes up when people say, wow, that's uh, you know, my house is worth a lot. Why don't I refi the mortgage and buy a new car? So now we get what feels like aggregate demand pushing up the price of goods and services. Mm -hmm. So that effort to get out of government debt would lead to inflation, which is that's how government debt, um, uh, loses its value. So an inflation breaks out, which governments can't really do a whole lot about. The Federal Reserve couldn't do anything about this. If everyone said, you know, we don't want to hold government debt anymore, and then the Fed says, well, here, have some money. And people say, wait a minute, money is just the same thing as government debt. Mm -hmm. I don't want any of this stuff. Well, now we're in trouble. Well, another question relating to the discount rate, it, you know, it's been a reflection of a high-risk premium ever since the crisis has emerged. And my question to you is, why is it taking so long for, you know, risk premiums to adjust back to more normal levels? Why? I mean, it's been seven years, and still we see these record low interest rates, high prices for government bonds in safe countries. So what's your story for the slow adjustment? Yeah, well, and here we're telling stories, which is dangerous. Uh, well, these stories can help know, us when, understand when, better the theory, so I think it's, it might be yeah, interesting. Yeah, one should do, well, one should do theories empirically. I mean, yeah, one can always, there's always a story, and it's always good. Yeah. Every theory, there is always an ex post story. So, you know, let's start with, can we cook up an ex post story? <laughs> uh, but recognize that everybody's theory can always sure. cook up an ex post story. It is get kind of puzzling. So there was a, a huge risk framing early on in the session where everybody wants mm -hmm. to uh, uh, hold government bonds. Uh, now the, the, the stories are, you know, the taste for risk has gotten better, and so, um, you know, the uh, stock prices have been driven up and so forth. Uh, yet still, the demand for government bonds seems to be very, very strong. Um, so what drives these risk premiums? Well, you know, uh, there is, John Campbell and I wrote a paper that kind of formalized this called By Force of Habit. There is a strong tendency in the business cycle. When, when things are going pretty well, and, uh, and, and your business is pretty safe and your job is pretty safe, people are willing to take more risks. And then when it gets dangerous, um, you know, yeah, there's a recession and, and a lot of people around you are getting fired and the guy is coming to repossess the, the house and the car and the dog. Um, you know, you might say, wow, stocks are a great deal right now, but I, I'm just not investing. So there's a natural way in which risk aversion rises in bad economic times. And it's just taken a long time to uh, to change. I mean, it, it's almost like the market needs a slap to the face. <laughs> hey, time to get that risk premium back to more normal levels. It's just no. It's just, I'm sorry. I wanted to cause, cause, go ahead. Uh, it's kind of puzzling because because demand is very strong for stocks and for government bonds, right? And corporate bonds. I mean, so the risk premium is actually quite low right now in the sense that stock prices relative to dividends okay. are quite high. There's this drive for risk. But people are also buying a whole lot of government bonds. Uh, so it, it, uh, some, some observers call this the savings glut. I hate value-laden words like that. But um, yeah, there's, there's overall a, a demand to save a lot, and a lot of that comes in the form of, of demand for government debt. Well, how about uh, this? The puzzle is that government debt doesn't look objectively; it doesn't look like that great a long-term investment. Mm -hmm. How are these guys going to pay this stuff off? Well, maybe there's no better an alternative, you know, on a risk-adjusted basis. Let me let me throw this story out. Well, there, there is there is the thought uh, I'm going to hold it for a while and get rid of it before things get bad, which is the danger yeah. that I kind of smell. When I talk to bond traders, they say, "Why are you holding these thirty-year bonds? Because our U.S. government, you think that." It's like two and a half percent. You really think inflation's going to be less than two and a half percent for thirty years? And they answer, "I'm not holding it for thirty years. I'm holding it for the next six months, and I'm going to sell it to some other sucker before the, the rates go up." Well, that's a dangerous psychology. <laughs> well, I, I Sorry, wonder. You're going to ask a question. No, no. I, I wonder to some extent also if if you know we got a couple things going on. So you mentioned the savings glut, which is another way of saying you know the the, the emerging world's growing rapidly. They, too, want safe assets. They can't get it at home, so they come to the U.S., and we provide these safe assets. In fact, you know, we, we are a, a bank to the world of sorts. We provide safe, liquid assets, and treasuries being one of them. Um, and so that, they, con they continue to grow. So there's, there's that issue. But there's also— Let, let, let me just— Yeah. Let, let me let's, let's stop and look at it, because this is often, oh, it's terrible, the savings, the global imbalances, and so forth. This is wonderful, <laughs> 
And, and, and you know, when things happen, not, not everything that happens is something awful. Yeah, that's wonderful for us. People in emerging markets in China want to get their money out of China, and they want to put it in somewhere that's safe. And the U.S. has financed a, a, an entire years of GDP and of deficits off of, the, off of selling paper to these poor Chinese people who should be investing in China. Uh, you know, the, the, the really the sad part is that, that people are too scared of the property rights right. in China to put their money in China. But, but large global flows, uh, large, lots of people saving and then, and then hopefully later being able to, to buy stuff. This is not a terrible economic problem. This is the economy working the way it's supposed to. Sorry, go ahead. No, but I think that also speaks to there aren't many good alternatives for these people, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's a puzzle, but at the same time, it's, it's, maybe it's pretty clear they don't have many good alternatives at home. But the second thing is... There's, there's good alternatives, but not safe alternatives. Like, so, you know, you're, right, you're right, right. There, there's high yielding... The marginal, pro- right. the marginal product of capital in China is really high. Right. Uh, but they're worried about the legal system. Right. They're worried about, yeah, but um, I, I should be investing in a fact... Mm. Investing in a factory in China versus an overpriced house in Palo Alto, um, <laughs> you know, from a social perspective, they should be buying that factory no, in China. I, I agree, absolutely. They want it, they're worried. Right. But, but st- stepping back and trying to explain these, these low discount rates for, on government bonds. So one factor is this you know, global saving glut, the demand for safe assets from around the world. The, the second thing, and this is a, a story I'm going to tell ex post, but we had the Great Recession. We had the crisis. And ever since then, we've had a spate of other mini crises that keep you know, some investors you know, rattled. We had you know, the fiscal cliff. We had the sequester that created, you know, Maybe nothing substantive, but created you know fears of, of government shutdown. We had the eurozone crisis that keeps reemerging. Now we have concerns from China. It seems we never really got a, a clear break from the bottom of the crisis. There's always something that keeps nagging at us that may be explaining why you know people still demand treasuries. Is that is that a reasonable story? It's a story, but it's a troublesome one because. Um all of these problems are government problems, and and you know government debt objectively does not look like a great investment. Uh, you know the fiscal cliff. We almost had a, a a technical default on U.S. Treasuries, which is supposed to not be able to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have to admit, I you know I, I scratch my head and puzzle. I don't own any. I'm not holding 30-year nominal government <laughs> bonds. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was interesting. Uh, I think it was a fiscal cliff when. Uh, the U.S. government debt was downgraded a notch, and nothing happened to interest rates. In fact, it probably went down even more if I had to go back and check. Um, you know, no one's paying attention to the rating agencies. They, they still want those bonds. Well, I think in, in, in big terms, um, the U.S. is not likely to formally default on its debt because the U.S. can, can print up money right. to pay off its debt. So the U.S. will – the danger is for the U.S. to inflate away its debt rather than default on its debt. And I, I think, um, you know, that's a very – now, the rating agencies know that. When they say – then they lower the knot to say, you know, we're, we're worried about inflating away your debt. Um, but uh, bondholders seem to treat those two things very differently, and I think with, with good reasons. Uh, a default is different from an inflation. Okay. Well, let's, let's go ahead and apply this theory to some historical cases. And I, I think we've already touched on – you know, my initial observation about right now what's going on in the world with low inflation. But let's talk about the great inflation of the mid-1960s to early 1980s when, um, you know, in the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson tried to fight a war in Vietnam, also to the Great Society. Um, maybe you know, that's one of the stories told. There's also the story that the Federal Reserve just lost control or had bad measurement or was influenced politically. How, do, how does the fiscal theory of the price level explain that period? Yeah, well, as you notice now, now I, I want to um, not shoot too, too many horns here. Um, that equa- that present value equation that you, that you stated mm-hmm. uh, does hold. It holds in every theory, and and really the question is by what mechanism does it hold? Does does a higher price, does a higher value of debt force the government? Uh, does a lower? If it's a value, if there's a great, if there's a, suppose there's a big deflation. It happens for other reasons. Mm-hmm. So that, does the government then go out and raise taxes in order to pay off a windfall for long-term bondholders? That you know, the causality can go both ways. But, but with let, that, with let me that ask, said, let me ask we'll one question. Yeah, let me before I get to the back to the historical cases. One question: Would you say then that the fiscal theory of the price level is a more general theory 
that has as a special case the standard monetary theory? There's two equations you mentioned. The, price, mm-hmm. the value of government debt is the present value of surpluses, and an equation involving some frictions that people like some kinds of government debt more than others, MD equals DY. Those two equations are present in every form of every model. In the monetary model, right. that present value equation is always there. Now, it's usually off in footnote 17 where, uh, you know, the office says, oh, the referee annoyed me about the government budget constraint. Yeah, I'll just assume that the government raises lump sum taxes as needed to make this equation hold. So they make other assumptions to, to make that thing go away. Um, so it's really not, it's, it's a question of where you focus your attention on, on which part of the common theory is the one really driving a, a historical event. Okay. And what you, so the question you brought up is, hey, yeah, Historical inflations in the U.S. Uh, don't just have the Federal Reserve screwing up. They have um, important things going on with fiscal policy, which leads, yeah, as, as, you know, if you start with the big ones, like Argentina. When Argentina has a huge collapse, or mm-hmm. Brazil, it's clear, the, and the government, by the way, is bankrupt. There's not, another thing that the, the central bank can do, monkeying around with interest rates or swapping one kind of debt for another to do anything. This is clearly people running away from the currency, and, and it's, it has not, it has, it's a physical problem. So um, that now the other historical episodes, you look at it and say, wait a minute, the, the Federal Reserve wasn't just screwing up in, in the absence of, of anything going on. There's always something interesting going on with fiscal policy. So the, the antecedent to the inflations of the 1970s were, yes, uh, Johnson wanted a great society and a Vietnam War, and started spending money you know, that, that wasn't getting so cut with taxes. And then 1972-73, the productivity slowdown uh, happened, and, and, the, and growth started falling down. Now, now, change in long-term growth is just a disaster for government finances because of this very long horizon you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then 1975 was the biggest deficit anyone had seen since World War II, with trend growth rates going down, and, you, and certainly there's a story to be told uh, people are losing faith in the U.S. government's uh, ability to, to pay back its debt. Uh, and guess what? We have inflation. Now, the next part of U- U.S. history takes us into Volcker and Reagan, and, and that kind of provides a nice segue into a question I've had is, what role does the fiscal theory of the price level have for central banks, for, for uh, you know the monetary uh authorities in a country. So the standard story told for you know getting out of the great inflation is that Paul Volcker stepped in. He was a man with a spine and he he ushered in two a double dip recession, two recessions in the early 80s. But in your writing you 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 also mentioned the role that Reagan played in this. And I guess my question is, you know, is it possible for a monetary authority to play some kind of signaling role or it, it signals that the government as a whole is more committed to low inflation uh, to low inflation and to to uh, bigger surpluses in the future? Yeah, absolutely. And and I want to flag, look, uh, I'm going to tell some stories, you're going to tell some stories. All of this needs really good articles to be written. I I hope you have some PhD students listening. Uh, You know, each of these episodes is worthy of of a serious paper to be written. You Mm -hmm. you don't do empirical economics just by telling stories. You start by telling stories, and then you see, can the story hold? That's why we're here. (laughs) So uh, now thinking the Volcker episode is, is pretty much the gold star for the standard story that is monetary policy that that can attack uh, right. inflation. Um, but when we look at the event, um, there is an important fiscal policy counterpart to it. Um, so I think of the Volcker as a joint fiscal monetary uh, disinflation. So, so Volcker raised interest rates, but there was also a tax reform that happened, a huge set of tax reforms. And in the event, those tax reforms at least coincided with or caused, depending on your, on your view of supply side economics, a huge economic boom. So that the, the present value of surpluses, in fact, uh, with ex post hindsight, rose tremendously. They, they simplified the tax code, they cut rates, uh, revenue started rising immediately. Um, and then there was an economic boom by which, you know, by, by the mid uh, Clinton years, uh, there was, there were so the surpluses were so large. We were worrying about having to retire the entire U.S. Mm-hmm. debt. So, so it actually made sense. And look, think about the opposite. 
Uh, Latin America has many failed stabilizations. A, 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 a central banker comes in and says, yes, we're going to do the tough thing, and he cuts the money supply and raises interest rates, but then nobody cleans up the government finances, and they're still running huge deficits, and the tax code is a disaster and, and, uh, and, and hurting economic growth. What happens? Two or three years later, the inflation breaks out again, and the whole thing falls apart. So, so that fits in my mind very well as a classic coordinated monetary fiscal uh, it, it policy um, to, to stop inflation. And the fiscal policy part of it was, was crucial. Without the fiscal policy, it wouldn't have happened. Now, the Fed actually is quite powerful in the fiscal theory of the price level. Um, and and I, I, I have a recent paper on it um, which sort of sets out the equations if, if you want to go look at it. Uh, we shouldn't go to papers. Um, well, I'll, but link the, to the central, I'll, I'll link to it. Yeah. It's a monetary policy with interest on reserves, kind of okay. sets out what can the what can a, a central bank, what can you do about inflation if you have no control over surpluses in the fiscal theory of the price level? And the answer is quite a lot. Um, basically, what you can do, you can set expected inflation to anything you want. Uh, it's the unexpected inflation you can't that the central bank can't do anything about. And and the simple version of this is. A currency reform. Every good monetary theory has to be able to handle the day on which Italy changes from the lira to the euro mm -hmm. and, and cuts three zeros off of every price. Uh, now, that, that, that kind of thing is the kind of thing a central bank can do. That, that thing has no, there's no fiscal policy involved. We're simply going to cut three zeros off the price of everything. Well, that means uh, the, the money supply falls by a factor of three, prices fall by a factor of three, government debt falls by a factor of three, but there's no change in real quantities at all. So central banks can do that kind of thing. They, they can change the unit. So the same way a company can have a share split. Okay. We can say, okay, you know, your, your IBM shares are worth 100 bucks each. We're going to simply do a two-for-one split. They're going to be worth 50 bucks each. So that, that's, that's inflation, right? We just, mm -hmm. we just changed the value of IBM. Now, we didn't change any profits. Uh, but you can certainly change the, the, the units with which uh, we measure things. So central banks can do that in the fiscal theory of the price level. And that, that's, that's, a quite, that's a quite powerful tool. And if you add a little bit of price stickiness in there, all of a sudden central banks uh, are, are effective. So what would you have a central bank target if, if you were uh, playing God for a while here? What, how would you have a central bank operate given your understanding of the fiscal theory of the price level? Here you're going to mix in um, some of my policy preferences mm -hmm. and and political views about the reliability of central banks to to wake up every morning and cleverly offset shocks and so forth. Um, I, I think um, the ideal monetary system is one with a constant price level. So, but let's set aside the difficulties of measuring inflation and let's suppose mm -hmm. the CPI is perfectly measured. Uh, I think we're doing our job if the CPI is 100 forever. Okay. Um, and, and, the, and the mechanism for doing that that I'd like to see is the equivalent of a gold standard. Now, gold doesn't work because the ratio of gold and goods prices is, goes up and down. But you can do essentially a CPI standard. And, and so I would like them to target expected inflation at zero uh, forever, now, uh, which they can do. Yeah, you've. I think you've mentioned in your writings you would have them target the uh, CPI futures contract. Is that right? There's lots of equivalent ways of doing it. Okay. Uh, I think I think they would end up targeting the spread between uh, tips and treasuries. Okay, the break-even inflation uh, that, rate. Yeah, that's uh, so. That's a way to explain the idea that is closest to current institutions. Mm -hmm. Target the spread, and and then you know if you target if you target that spread, and you and you say we'll do what it takes. Uh, expected inflation has to end up being what you say it's going to be. The Fed can target one thing. So just um, the CPI futures contract is another way of explaining the same idea. That people understand how a gold standard works. If you say the price of gold is 100 bucks an ounce, <laughs> and you buy and sell as much as you want 100 bucks an ounce, you, you know you can see how the Fed's going to target the price of gold. Mm -hmm. So uh, the CPI futures contract is a way of saying, hey, this works the same way as the gold standard. Now you can see how the Fed could set the CPI to 100 forever. Right. Now, just to be clear, you said a price level. So you would have the Fed 
um, make up for past mistakes if it happened to go one year where we had high in, we had inflation or deflation. It would it would actually compensate for that. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. And this this I think gets you the it gets you the advantages of the gold standard, which is centuries of price stability. Mm-hmm. Without the disadvantages, uh, centuries of long run price stability. Without the disadvantages of the gold standard, which are hu- many many disadvantages, in particular you know bouts of big inflation and deflation. If, if expected inflation is always zero, uh, you get you know a little bit up, a little. You know, you're not going to have big variability in actual inflation. But yeah, uh, you're, you're going to squeeze it back out again, uh, and uh, because the value of money, uh, you know. We don't muck around with the length of the yard or the meter. You know, if, if you're in a, if, suppose you're in a, uh, a recession and the tailors are in trouble, you don't want to cut down the value of the yard to 35 inches to, you know, help the tailors to sell a little bit more. That's what we're doing with money. So mm-hmm. I, I like the idea of a, a standard of value, which is just, we're not going to use this as a policy tool. The, the, the standard of value is going to be the dollar's worth 100 uh, it's going to be worth this basket of goods forever and ever. Okay. Now, Sargent and Wallace first talked about the fiscal theory of the price level. I think it was them who first talked about it about over 30 years ago. And it seems to me, other than you and a few other people, it hasn't gained a lot of traction. And my question is why? Oh, well, because, uh, you know, we're the visionaries who saw it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, fi- you're avant-garde, huh? You're, you're leading the charge. We're avant-garde. Well, I, you know, and there is a fact. Um, uh, you know, it, you don't get invited to a lot of talks at the Fed talking about the fiscal <laughs> price level. Right. You get invited to talk to the Fed if you, if you write about interest rate rules. Uh, but it's not not the theory. So anyway, oh, maybe we're all wrong. Um, uh uh, why hasn't it gained traction? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping into it full. Uh, because it hasn't gained traction, I see an opportunity right. for me to, to work on what I think has got to be uh, the, the, uh, the theory of the future and get in there early before, uh, before someone else does. And you mentioned it's not a popular topic at the Fed. I, I was joking once with a Fed economist that I would love to see Janet Yellen. Actually, I wouldn't because this would, this would royal the markets. But in, in, in a, maybe in a play or a skit, have Janet Yellen get up and say, I give up. This is, this is ridiculous. I believe in the fiscal theory of the price level. This press conference is completely pointless. <laughs> Everything you do, yeah. every word you hang on is, is meaningless. Go home and read no, the no, fiscal theory of the price level. We, we don't want to, so, so in fact, a central bank does have a strong, it can set nominal interest rates. And it has a strong effect on uh, on uh, inflation and real activity, even in the fiscal period of the price level. So there's there's actually plenty of I shouldn't have made this. Okay. There's, there's plenty of things central banks can use this. But the fact of policy world, the policy world is and should be 30 to 40 years behind the research frontier. Uh, most of the policy world right now thinks in pretty unadorned mid 1970s Dornbush and Fisher ISLM with an acceleration to Phillips curve. That, that, that is how things, how the Fed thinks about things, it's how the OECD thinks about things, it's how the IMF thinks about things. Uh, it, it is, you know, and that's, you know, the people now running it, that's what they learned as undergrads and grad students, that's, that's the, the, the framework that they tell stories with. Fiscal theory of the price level is, is you, you, have to, you have to first embrace sort of new Keynesian economics, and then you have to understand why it doesn't really work, and then you can sort of move on to fiscal theory. And we haven't done the academic research. The questions you ask me are exactly the right questions. We've done the deep theory. We know mm-hmm. this theory works. We've done the framework. We know the framework works. We've started to think about how do you adapt the framework to real-world frictions. We've started to think about how do you put in these discount rate effects. Then what do you got to do? You need a convincing... Uh, account of these historical episodes that you that you told me about, and not just convincing. And you know, oh, here's a story. We need a convincing, you know, real empirical work saying here's how you understand these episodes with the fiscal theory of the price level. Then you need a convincing analysis of of, of what's happening. The question you serve, what's happening now, and then maybe you can tell central banks what to do, and they'll say, oh, this is a framework that we could use for every day. You know, you got to do the work first. Okay. So that's why policy doesn't do it. Why don't academics jump on board to do this work? Well, I hope they will. That's why I'm doing this podcast. Right, and you're writing a book. So, 
Um, yes, exactly. Let me l- let's take this idea and apply it to what the Fed's done over the past seven years with quantitative ease and had three QE programs. And you've been very skeptical of them, and I think it's tied to your understanding of the fiscal theory of the price level. Could you share with our listeners uh, why you think they were largely ineffective? The, the QE programs, have the, the recent couple of years, have been, when you look at it, really wonderful test cases for um, theories of the price level. And the amazing thing is that absolutely nothing happened. We, we set off what should have been atomic bombs. <laughs> nothing mm-hmm. happened. Uh, Quantitative easing, so, so for your listeners, there, there used to be something like banks had like $50 billion of money in reserves of the Fed. Uh, the Fed then bought something like $3 trillion worth of uh, treasuries and, and turned that into bank reserves. So that is the supply of what we call money exploded from $50 billion to $3 trillion. Uh, so you can think about you know, money times velocity equals price times income and say, oh, my gosh. Uh, the, the Fed just did, um, mm-hmm. you know, a factor of 60. They increased the money supply by a factor of 60. Um, a factor of three, if you count, you know, it depends on what you call money, which has mm-hmm. been one of the problems always. But they did this huge thing. That, that should have set off the hyperinflation. No, and nothing happened. Well, say, well, why did nothing happen? Well, because, because to a bank holding uh, interest-paying reserves at the Fed or holding treasuries is exactly the same thing. So when the Fed buys treasuries and from banks and gives bank reserves instead, uh, in, in, in my analysis, that's, that's like buying red M&Ms and giving you back green M&Ms or, or taking your 20s and giving you two fives and a 10 for each one of them. Um, we, we have to remember that about the Fed. They, they don't print money and hand it out. But that's called fiscal policy. Mm-hmm. The, the Treasury, <laughs> if, if you're writing right. checks to voters in our system, the Treasury writes checks to voters, not the Fed. So one of the biggest confusions is to think that monetary policy consists of giving money to people, which they then spend. That, that, that could cause them inflation. They don't. They buy treasuries and give you back money in return. And at zero interest rates or when, in, when reserves pay interest, that operation is, is just you know, buying and selling the same thing from, from the point of view of uh, – well, the fiscal theory then says that, – so that's the reason why I, I think – QE doesn't doesn't have any effect. It, it shouldn't have any effect. You're, you're, you know, taking your 20s and giving you fives and tens is not going to make you go out and spend more. Um, now, if you take that view, the problem is then you've lost the traditional what well, what causes inflation. And the fiscal theory is, is what comes to the rescue and says, look, and I can tell you what determines inflation, even if you're in a world where money and bonds are perfect substitutes. Mm-hmm. So, Q, the fact that we – this is like a, a great experiment. Um, you know, you, you, you're wondering if, if changing thing, if changing the – if open market operations matter at all. Well, let's find out if open market operations matter at all. Let's do 60 times bigger than you've ever done ever in history and see what happens. Then what happens is absolutely nothing. <laughs> so that really does reinforce the view that, that, uh, that money and bonds can be perfect substitutes for mixed. Well, in the time I have left with you, I, I want to ask you, what advice would you give to a young, budding macroeconomist? You know, what would you tell them to do? What, 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 what choices to make in terms of becoming a successful macroeconomist? Well, uh, don't listen to old folks like me, because uh, <laughs> most of us tell you to do uh, like what we did, and that's usually bad advice, because mm-hmm. none of us did what old folks told us to do. <laughs> You know, the most successful economists are ones who just blatantly ignored all the advice that hmm. given. But certainly you can see the trends. Um, hmm. And the trends, right, you know, we live in the computer age. All uh, academics, successful academics, is a lot of intellectual arbitrage. So, you know, De Bruyne, Aaron De Bruyne in the 1950s did some intellectual arbitrage from fixed-point theorems. And, and, and that was very, you know, they proved general equilibrium. In the 1980s, Hanson and Sargent did intellectual arbitrage. They learned how to do uh, dynamic programming and, and, and linear time series analysis. And, and look what they achieved with, with that kind of stuff. Well, now, of course, computers. Computers, Internet, large data. Um, you know, what, what are the, what are the Raj, Raj Chetty, Matt Jenskow, what, what are the young, hot economists doing? Uh, they are leveraging um, computers, Internet, and, and data handling. So... Mm-hmm. You know, the usual advice is go out and take measure theory, and I would say, no, go, go and make sure you know how to program computers in, in a large, structured environment, because that seems to be 
uh, what's going on, certainly in finance, uh, certainly in microeconomics. Uh, we'll see where macro is going. Um, now, macro, I think uh, we're a little bit stuck in always explaining the last data point, but um, uh, macro, too, is starting to exploit uh, larger data. It's becoming more empirical. Um, and and it, uh, it needs a new, cleaner, and better theory is on its way, I, I hope. Yeah, it will be interesting to see. Noah Smith has written some articles, you know, describing this the shift in the profession towards more applied empirical work, at least for microeconomists. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to macro, because macro is still a lot of, you know, uh, model DSGE type models, less empirical. And that's because we don't have as many natural experiments in, to run on. But maybe with increased technology, better data, we, we can make some progress on that front. So people really don't believe big models anymore. The big black box approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now, but can we bring smaller uh, transparent models to work in understanding policy? Uh, and it, clearly there's going to be a shift in, in what kind of thinking uh, people use to think about the macroeconomy. But the big picture is always, you know, so, so Galileo got famous. Uh, and he didn't get famous by sitting in his office and thinking about things. He invented a better telescope. And then he looked at the skies and, and saw, oh, my gosh, you know, there's, there's mountains on the moon. Uh, and that's what's happening in, in certainly in micro. Um, people are, the, the telescope of the moment is, is large data, Internet, and computers. Mm -hmm. And people who can use the new technology are discovering new things. So in macro as well, I mean, the general advice for any scientist is, you know, figure out where the new telescopes are. And, and that's where the, uh, and that's what happened in the previous generation. You know, Gene Fama was uh, when uh, he, he, he told me about when he was young and, and computers were punch cards that you had to take down to the computer machine at 11 o'clock at night. Well, he <laughs> was the only one who knew how to do the punch cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, I, I was able to do stuff that other people could just dream about because they learned how to use the computers. So, hmm. uh, you know, figure out how to do something new. Don't just do what the old folks are doing. That's always the key. Well, on that great bit of advice, we have to end as we've run out of time. Our guest today has been John Cochran of the Hoover Institution. John, thanks for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.